start recording here. Oh yeah! Tobacco and nicotine. Tobacco and nicotine. It's kind of funny that we're actually talking about tobacco and nicotine because in the United States, tobacco use has dropped dramatically. This is not the case in the rest of the world, especially the developing world. I have a little bit of uh, show and tell with uh, John Oliver there uh, in a little bit. Um, and I usually, so when I fir would first make this, it would just be, it, it used to just be tobacco. But with the rise of vaping and e-cigarettes, I just decided to also talk about nicotine. So everything I mostly say about tobacco use has to do with smoking cigarettes, hence the comic. But I also want to point out that much of the use of um, tobacco products, as well as e-cigarettes and, and vaping products, has to do with the drug of choice here, which is nicotine. Okay, so that's uh, what we are uh, chatting about today. So to get us started, there we go is the uh, good old fashioned uh, PSA. This I is Debbie. I had my first cigarette when I was 13. When I found out how bad it was, I tried to quit. But I couldn't. They say nicotine isn't addictive. How can they say that? So, if you didn't grow up in California, you may never have heard of Debbie. How many, uh, let me know in chat if you've seen an advertisement, uh, anti-smoking advertisement with Debbie. Or somebody like her. Okay. Um. Okay. Very good. Okay, good, 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 good. So, um, most of you, if not all of you, have never lived in a world where smoking advertisements, like for cigarettes, were actually a thing. Everything that you have grown up looking at um, and knowing about cigarettes have always been anti-smoking advertisements. Which is, um, which is interesting, to say the least. Um, so, smoking cigarettes used to be and maybe still the single greatest cause of preventable death um, in, in the entire world. Okay, if we're just, if we're talking globally. Preventable death. Single greatest cause of preventable death. And the reason why I say preventable death is because you could not smoke. Right? There's always that level of pre preventive, um, preventative measures from engaging in tobacco use, right? Um, so you can see here that, so this this graph is obviously about 20 some year, about 20 years out of date, maybe a little less than 20 years out of date. Um, this, uh, this trajectory though, has not really been back up here, right? There may be um, some ups and downs over the last, 20 years, but it's mostly on a downward trajectory. So here we have like 2001, maybe. Um, 2002. Maybe 2005. Um, but as you can see, it's a downward trajectory. And there have a lot, been a lot of reasons for this downward trajectory since the peak in the 1960s. Okay, so, uh, interestingly, when people don't have money, they smoke less, okay? So if you make 
tobacco products expensive, then you will see a decrease in that, okay? Uh, this 15.5 is a recent figure in the last five years or so. 15.5% of US adult smoke. It's a pretty decent percentage, considering that we used to be all the way up here, right? Um, monitor, the monitoring the future study here, lowest youth-related smoking cigarettes in 40 years. And um, this is in five years, the WHO predicts um, that seven out of 10 smoking deaths, that's actually should be smoking deaths, sorry. When I wrote that, I guess I was just writing really quickly. So seven out of 10 smoking related deaths will occur in developing countries rather than developed countries like uh, Western. So Western uh, countries like um, most of Europe, um, the United States, Canada, okay. So developing countries are gonna see cigarette deaths. And the John Oliver segment that I will share parts of with you um, is really gonna tell you why that is, okay? So smoking increased significantly after the end of World War II. Smoking was used as a stress coping mechanism Okay, um, but in the 1950s, the first medical reports that linked smoking and cancer led to a sharp decline, but then advertisements, okay, um, U.S. Surgeon General puts out its first report based on that research. You can see a small decline there. The Fairness Doctrine messages on the radio, television and radio, now get to compete with pro-smoking ads anti-smoking ads so anti-smoking ads now get to compete with um pro-smoking advertisements because they get the same amount of airtime that's what the fairness doctrine um was put in place for and so you see then a short a, a smaller uh, a smaller decline okay broadcast advertising ban in 1971 or something like uh, somewhere around early 1970s um, any broadcast TV was not allowed to show a pro-smoking advertisement, so a, a company-based advertisement, okay? Um, ooh, Ellie. She's, um, she wants a cookie, for one thing, but, um, she's not going pee this morning, so... That's where we're at. So if you can hear her crying, that's why. Um, and so you can see the decline pretty much starts at that point, this giant decline, right? So non-smokers' -smoker, rights movements begin. So these are the ones that you see now as truth, okay? Those are all started because of non-smoking, non-smokers' rights, um, banning things, you know, banning smoking and federal things. And then you have the cigarette taxing, doubling, the federal tax for the cigarettes doubling, and then you have states enacting their own measures, right? So, um, you see that decline, that decline has continued. But, as we'll see in a little while, vaping has changed the, changed the nature of how to account for nicotine use that isn't through tobacco products, right? Because they're technically different. So we'll see, we'll talk a little bit about vaping in just a minute because that's that's essentially just pure nicotine. Um, so, now so what do smokers look like? Well, you can see that as education levels increase, that is going from, um, right to left on this graph as education levels decrease or increase excuse me so does the amount of smoking percentage of that group smoking cigarettes okay so they uh, so cigarette use typically typically is a feature 
of less ed educated individuals. Okay. So healthy people 2000. So that there was a healthy people 2010 and then there was healthy people 2020 and hopefully there'll be a healthy people 2030. These are all these are all um, federal government programs through health and human services. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. But um, healthy people 2000. So 20 years ago, it had a goal of 15 percent. You can already I mean, you already know that recently the figure was 15.5 percent. So we haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, I'm assuming the the goal for 2030 should be lower than 15%. I would say maybe somewhere around 10. But I'm not a policymaker. I'm not a health policymaker. So I would not hazard a guess as to what Healthy People 2030 would suggest. Um, I don't even, I'm, I'm not even sure what Healthy People 2020 was. And you can go look that up if you go type in Healthy People 2020. So... What does smoking do? It does a lot of things. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Single most preventable cause of illness, disability, and premature death in much of the world. Good times, right? Good times. It's responsible for one in five U.S. deaths. This is recent. Okay. The mortality rate for smokers is 70% higher than non-smokers, okay? Uh, now, something that I don't have on the slides is connected to our current circumstances. Smokers are, are one of the groups at higher risk of um, dying from COVID-19, okay? And that is because their lungs are not as good. This will probably be true but I, I'd imagine the jury is out on this. The science is not there yet. Uh, this would likely be true for people who vape as well at a higher risk of developing complications and potentially dying from COVID-19 and because it's a, it's a lower respiratory infection. Lower respiratory infections are brutal, as I'm sure you've heard, right? Um, at the same time, if you're damaging lung tissue from smoking or ingesting any kind of in smoke inhalation, whether it's um, just vape without nicotine, whatever whatever that is, um, and other things, then you are decreasing your lungs' ability to fight off infection because that tissue is already damaged, right? So we have reduced life expectancy overall, but in our current circumstances, smokers have an increased risk for um, complications, and those complications, generally speaking, are breathing-related. So being unable to breathe, and that will likely result in death. Okay? So if you know a smoker, maybe give them a nudge. A place of caring, of course, right? From... Uh, from a perspective of caring, like, I care about you, I don't want you to die, maybe you should put down that cigarette. <laughs> Increased heart rate and blood pressure leading to cardiovascular disease. Very good, Stephanie. I'm so glad, I'm so glad that, um, that they did. Very good. <laughs> so... As we talked about with cardiovascular disease, you know, months ago, years ago, uh, arteriosclerosis is caused by, is a hardening of the arteries, and one of the major contributors to arteriosclerosis is um, cigarette smoke, right? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty gnarly, okay. Uh, half of deaths, half of all deaths due to cardiovascular disease, lung cancer, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is smoking related. Okay, half of all deaths that are in that group are all smoking related. That is that smoking contributed significantly to the decline and death of that individual, right? Uh, a person who smokes two packs a day for 20 years will lose eight years off of their average life expectancy. So that's in the 
a what? High 70s for um, U.S. males, and in the, um, I think it's reached 80 or 81 for um, U.S. females. So, yeah, that's eight. That's eight years off of that average lifespan. Whoo, do. Um, there's my COVID connection there, respiratory infections. Uh, your lungs just aren't good. So even, even, even if COVID isn't the absolute cause of death, COVID related pneumonia will, uh, be compounded, uh, in a, in smoker's lungs. Okay. Obviously significant leaks to numerous cancers. The links are so conclusive that we do say that smoking causes cancer, okay? Ever since the Surgeon General's report in the 1950s, smoking causes cancer, okay? Pregnancy risks, of course, low birth weights in infants. There is no tobacco, um, there is no tobacco fetal syndrome or fetal tobacco syndrome, okay? But, uh, like there is for um, alcohol, but it increases risks uh, of miscarriage. Uh, sudden infant death syndrome, so SIDS. So after the child is born, it has an increased risk of SIDS because of developing um, within a smoker. And then low birth weights, okay, which um, not good if the child cannot put that weight on in the first um several days of life okay um and then then this can translate that as if the child survives infancy um this can then translate to learning difficulties okay and learning disabilities um the insidious thing about nicotine as well as um some of the other um, compounds that you find in cigarettes and other tobacco products like um, dip um, or cigars is that um, when you burn them other chemicals are produced and other chemicals are ingested or inhaled right what ends up happening is this then gets disguised as aging there has been there was a an interesting um there's an interesting anti... I think I have it in my in my uh, video that I'm going to show. Um, where it's an old woman, but she's like... You know, it looks like an old woman, but then the caption says that she's like 35 years old. Right? So nicotine and other tobacco products will increase the appearance of aging, right? Um, mental decline. Seemingly related to... Um, uh, the invisible strokes that we talked about, okay? Um, neurotoxic effects of nicotine and other drugs inhaled that pass the blood-brain barrier will increase risk of developing dementia or potentially Alzheimer's disease later in life. And this is would be considered early onset because of the age at which it appears in smokers. And then you've, you're likely aware of secondhand smoke and um the fact that it becomes an iron environmental danger okay and nine out of ten americans are exposed to what is called environmental tobacco smoke right which is a, a fancy name for secondhand smoke so exhaled smoke or that is smoke that is um coming off the end of the cigarette is uh full of carcinogens i i will say that even though um, vape makers say that the only thing that's exhaled by vaping is water vapor. That is c categorically, um, false because water vapor doesn't have a smell. Okay. So if you can smell something coming out of a person's mouth from vaping, that means there are other chemicals in that smoke. Okay. So you're not just breathing out, um, uh, you're not just breathing out water vapor. If you are, if you are vaping or if you know somebody who's vaping, so don't let somebody breathe in your face, right? Um, vaping while potentially less harmful than cigarette ETS is still an ETS. 
okay? Um, and so if you are exposed to this, you do have a risk. Or, and if you are exposed to this on an ongoing basis, chronically exposed to ETS, then higher, higher risk of cardiovascular disease because that is contributing to the arteriosclerosis, okay? So how does, um, how does smoking start? Well, look at these two girls. Uh, this is just from your book. Um, <laughs> I think it's in color now. But uh, they're teenagers. They're teenagers. These these darn kids. S smoking. Use a lighter. Sheesh. Anyways, um, initiation. That's the first thing that uh, happens. Okay. Well, hello, Billy John, dear professor. Um, if you say anything else, you are getting banned. Well, just listen. So people get started by... I, that came off a little wrong. I didn't. I did, just didn't want you to be a troll, sir. Um, so just be kind. Listen. This is for a class. You are welcome to watch. Maybe you could. Maybe if you are a smoker, you will um, not smoke. But that's what I have for you today. <laughs> Everyone in class is like. All right. Back to initiation. So. Initiation, generally speaking, comes uh, from a social situation, okay? From a social situation. Oops. There are two models for what happens when people continue to smoke, okay? The nicotine titration model, which is a more biologically based model. Okay, and the essential idea about the nicotine titration model is that people become physically dependent on nicotine. It is, uh, it is a, it is a, an insidious, one of the most addictive substances known to known to humans uh, is nicotine, and because it is titrated in such small quantities as you smoke a cigarette, that. Once you build up tolerance, you need more cigarettes to get that. And so you then continue to smoke and 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 smoke. And that's the maintenance, right? The other model is more of a psychological model. It's the affect management, right? And so that is the the effects of what nicotine does for you. So nicotine is a stress reliever, okay? It's a stimulant. And so... It's used to regulate emotional states, right? Smoking cessation. So initiation, getting started. Maintenance is the continuation of smoking. And then cessation is the idea of stopping or stopping, right? Um, it depends on who and what you're talking or when you're talking about cessation. So um, you're not going to get somebody to stop smoking or um, quit nicotine products if they're not ready to. Okay, you can't force somebody to quit. Nicotine will not let you do that. Okay. Um, and so cold turkey, not necessarily the best solution unless somebody's really, really ready to do it. Okay. So cessation comes from being ready to do it. And so if you know somebody who smokes and you want to get them to stop smoking, then what you need to be is supportive and educational, right? You need to break the cognitive dissonance that somebody has in order to get them to stop, okay? Um, doesn't happen to everyone, stopping and then never starting again. There is obviously still some potential for relapse, just like with any drug user that has um, stopped using their drug of choice. There's relapse possibilities, okay. All right, um, prevention programs. Oh man, I am, 
Am I running out of time? I don't even know. Um, prevention programs. Most of the prevention programs that you are familiar with have been um, informational campaigns about the uh, really nasty stuff about cigarettes and cigarette smoking and tobacco use, right? Um, however, the ads and campaigns them some, blah, 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 themselves have been, I think for obvious reasons, and maybe not obvious reasons, but for, I mean, for me, they're obvious reasons. Um, they have been less effective in minority communities, like um, black communities or Latinx communities, okay? Um, and it has to do with the struggle in those communities to handle severe amounts of stress, an inordinate amounts of stress, and um, pressure campaigns from both equals in the community as well as pro-tobacco and nicotine advertising. There are also fewer uh, higher educated individuals in minority uh, populations, so that is also a contributing factor. Okay. Some of the most creative slash um, effective, but potentially not educational, ads I found um, from this... Uh, Oh, I don't remember what website I found it in. So this is a, a screen cap of a, um, there's this, uh, 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 so I screencasted this because the, the one website that I was going to use to scroll won't load anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. There's some music, um, but mostly it's, um, just 17 print ads. So they're images, right? So... I have a warning that some of them are tough to look at because of how vivid they are. Um, but um, yeah, some of these are, you may have seen some of these before. So I'm going to go ahead and play that. Um, Stephanie, nicotine gum is generally speaking a um, cessation maintenance um, thing. Um, so... It's not as bad as smoking, no. It's, uh, it's supposed, it's to, it's a, it's a way to, uh, get people to lessen the amount of nicotine over time. I really like the cigarette box. Because it can make your teeth fall out. You can see I added some, some really sad music. You've seen this one already. This is the secondhand smoke that's forming a bag over the kid's head, right? Smoking isn't just suicide, it's murder is the tagline on that, just in case you can't see it. Oh, there you go. This is the one, this is the one that I was talking about. Oh, uh, 42, not 35. You get the point, though. This is a suggestion about sperm. So the matchsticks are crappy sperm cells. Kids saying, yes, I smoke only when my dad is around. Secondhand smoke. When did I smoke my first cigarette? I don't know, I'd have to ask my dad. Like these, they use kids to be very frightening. Okay. Music's getting sad but uplifting. Cancer uh, cure smoking, downloading cancer, yep, uh, right. 
cigarette smoke people. Damn! The smoker's lung, this was um, out front of a store. It was an ashtray. That in the shape of lungs. The, um... The tailpipe cover. The hospital bed. That's supposed to look like a cigarette. Excellent scrolling skills, don't you think? I have some I have some good scrolling skills. Baby onesie with full of black lungs. I got the black lung, pop. <laughs> That's a Zoolander reference for all of you. Um, this one's a bit rough, so turn away if you don't want. I stop scrolling, but if you keep watching, it's pretty rough. It's pretty rough. French, uh, this is from a French um, advertising company. As you can see, it says Fumer. I don't know how to s speak French, but Fumer is smoking. Or smoke. And then these people making out with animals. Good times. And there we are. And that is the end, right? Good stuff, right? Shush. Uh, additional things are making, uh, smoking, um, have negative consequences. So, mostly this is done through social engineering, um, uh, by increasing the taxes. It's super effective, okay? Government uses tax increase on cigarettes. Super effective, okay? Um, other... Uh, other things that governments have done to socially engineer aversive consequences increase punishments for uh, minors that are caught smoking and or trying to purchase cigarettes. Um, so banning of smoking in public places. So in Illinois, you shouldn't be smoking, I think, within 20 feet of entrances and you may not smoke inside. So that's that. Um, Sarah's asking, does smoking cannabis impact your lungs as much as cigarettes do? Uh, the answer to that question, generally speaking, is no. Um, except in the case of what is in, or what, how you're smoking it. Um, whether you're smoking flour directly, either in a joint, or a, um, bong, or a bowl, you know, a, a pipe. Um... Because that's generally speaking just flour. Okay. Um, and so you're only inhaling the substances that are contained within the flour. Uh, there are issues with that, of course. You are decreasing your lungs' abilities to, you know, right? Because you're introducing a foreign substance into your lungs. It's obviously not good. Um, if you are taking hits off, like, vape pens or vape you know vape e-cigarette devices using oil well the thing last year was that um people were dying from vaping right um and it was found that cartridges that came from china that had vitamin e acetate as the holder of the cannabis concentrate was coating people's lungs right because vitamin e acetate um is fat soluble and that cannot be in your lungs um because it was just, it was just clumping and that's why people were dying um people generally speaking weren't dying from vaping nicotine products so they were so the people that were dying last year and maybe still be still dying you know it's hard to tell with the focus on covid but um those people were generally speaking before before the pandemic hit um we were we, I say we, doctors were pretty, pretty sure that it was being caused by vitamin E acetate coating lungs. So, no, it's not. To answer your question, it doesn't do as much damage, but it, de but A, it depends on what you are inhaling, okay? Whether it's flour directly or a vape product, um... 
and two, how much you're doing it, right? Generally speaking, people um, do not smoke cannabis the same way they smoke um, nicotine. And that is because nicotine is, is, has, is in lower quantities in cigarettes than the amount of cannabis and slash THC that you get in a single hit of uh, cannabis. Hopefully that helps. Uh, other programs for um, telling people to not to do this. Inoculation programs teach adolescents practical skills and resisting pressures to smoke. No. No. Oh, I'll take your cigarette, crumple it up, throw it on the ground. Yeah, that's how I respond to people who offer me cigarettes. No thanks, I don't want your cancer stick. I'm cool. Cool people don't smoke. No, they don't. So those are the skills you learn. Yeah. Um, other things that influence smoking. Social pressure. That's where most initiation um, instances come from. People just don't go thinking to themselves, you know what I want to go do? Without any other input whatsoever, I want to smoke a cigarette. It's like, no, dummy, you live in Illinois. Just go buy some weed. It's fine. Right? Media information. Of course, this is this is different these days because there is very little media information. But worldwide, so in the United States, this, generally speaking, isn't an influencer. But globally, it oh, my gosh, it sure is. It sure is. Uh, media information is all over the place because laws are just not the same. The, the laws aren't the same. And then people might smoke because uh, anxiety. It's a, Nicotine is a stimulant, and so it reduces anxiety. In, uh, and, and because it's titrated in such small quantities in each cigarette, and so you need c these cigarettes to uh, take advantage of its effects, um, it, it helps reduce the anxiety. As, uh, which is different from what we talked about with cannabis, and that is, like, if you have too much THC, it can actually increase anxiety. Uh, other social engineering programs uh, include outlawing, um, but as we determined with the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution, outlawing something that people enjoy considerably, regardless of the social negative consequences, does not work. People are going to do it anyways. So as far as other social engineering programs are, con are concerned, it doesn't really work. Okay. Uh, as I said, taxation. Okay. In Illinois, it's $1.98 in excise taxes. Okay. Uh, it's the fourth highest state excise tax. Um, excise taxes are sometimes referred to as sin tax. I think I talked about those. Um, I, I, I talked about those with, with cannabis. And so the average price per pack in Illinois, this is in Illinois, uh, is $11.50. Holy crap. That's lunch, man. That's lunch. Which comes out to about $4,200 per year. If you're talking about an average smoker. And a pack, I think, what, comes with 30 cigarettes? I, I have no idea. I've never purchased a pack of cigarettes before. But $11.50. Woo! Woo! And we also have Tobacco 21 Law now, which I don't think I added to these this, to this slideshow. I don't think I added to it. Um, social engineering. Uh, additional stuff is um, restricting smoking, like I said. I uh, probably should just combine this with the slides that I had earlier, right? Uh, so California was the first state to ban smoking indoors in 1995. I put that in because I have some pride for my home state. Okay. And this included restaurant, bars, etc. Uh, Wisconsin went smoke-free in 2010. Okay. That's from when I taught this in Wisconsin. Um, I don't, it's 20 per pack, Katie. Thank you. That's, that's rough. Wisconsin went smoke-free in 2010, and it, it, it was the first state to say that any hotel or motel rooms had to be smoke-free, right? You were not allowed to smoke inside at all, okay? And a couple of reasons for this, a couple of reasons for this to our neighbors in the north. Um, 
a lot of fire related deaths and fire related issues so houses burning down that sort of thing were determined to be caused by cigarettes so that is maybe somebody fell asleep with a burning cigarette fell on the carpet ignited the carpet and then there you go so that's why they included hotel rooms and motel rooms in this law in 2010 because they wanted to prevent preventable fires okay and cigarette caused cigarette caused fires are obviously preventable okay um i n i never went and grabbed the um never went and grabbed the um uh, the the Illinois one I, it's mostly recent it's one of the tw it's one of the most states enacted in the last 20 years um notably absent from the um states are the south so if you go anywhere Tennessee Kentucky Alabama Florida uh Texas is changing quite a bit um Georgia South Carolina uh, Mississippi, these states do not have bans to smoking inside or bans like that. Anya, traveling over spring break, we stayed at a motel and they asked if we wanted smoking or non-smoking. Huh. Where were you? It's not a law in Illinois, I don't believe. All right. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to pause on this. It's a really good one. And I might have you just watch it on your own uh, because I do want to get through some of the other stuff. Um, and we have about 10 minutes left in class. Um, and that's, that's the global use. So what about worldwide use? That's what it is. Uh, cessation programs include the great American smoke out kick butts. Get it? Print and broadcast ads, no smoking pledge drives, smoking bans, and other programs, right? These are cessation products. So um, addiction models would suggest that you should replace cigarettes with um, smaller and smaller doses of nicotine. So that's pharmacological therapy or nicotine replacement programs. So these are the transdermal nicotine patches. This is nicotine gum, as Stephanie asked earlier. These are inhalers, right? <sighs> um, bupropion or Zyban, right? Um, Chantix is another one. You you may have seen Chantix commercials with the turkey, right? Because quitting cold turkey is probably not a good idea. Um, so Zyban and Chantix. Interesting, interesting uh, thing about them is that um, if you... Um, some side effects do incur do include death, um, in very rare cases, but um, some of the side effects are pretty gnarly for these things because these drugs are counteracting the effects of nicotine and the effects of nicotine withdrawal, and that's pretty rough. You can also engage in cognitive behavioral therapy, so doing aversion therapy, um, a la Hank Hill. Uh, Hank Hill and Bobby Hill, where Hank makes Bobby smoke all of those cigarettes till barfing. I showed that clip last semester in learning, if you were in learning. Um, changing uh, beliefs about your health and smoking attitudes, right? So reducing the positive attitudes one has still smoking and increasing the health beliefs. So like, hey, you should be healthy like this. Um, other CBT treatments... Okay. Uh, um, one sort of dangerous method, I'm going to call it dangerous because this is really shouldn't be done without proper medical supervision, is a form of satiation therapy. It's a form of aversion therapy in which a smoker is forced to increase smoking until an unpleasant state of fullness is reached. Rapid smoking. So you see this somewhat in the Hank, in, in the King of the Hill clip. Bobby actually gets sick. Like, he wants to vomit. Could you get the hose with that? Oh. Um. So satiation would stop. Would You would stop before you reach that point. It's still something that only should be done in the presence of a, of a trained medical professional. 
any intervention that anyone does in a cessation program um, needs to be tied to the specific group that person comes from, which takes into account cultural traditions, values, and gender. Okay? Those are the most um, effective programs. Okay? There are three factors for quitting smoking. So to start quitting smoking and then ultimately quitting smoking, right? So you have to have the motivation to quit, like I said, okay? Even in the face of withdrawal symptoms. So Stephanie, kudos to your dad for quitting cold turkey in the face of withdrawal symptoms. They're pretty gnarly for nicotine. Um, how much physical dependence the nicotine Yes. So how long has that person been smoking cigarettes is a real good question, right? The level of physical dependence for a casual smoker who's been smoking only socially for two years is going to be different than the physical dependence of somebody who smokes two packs a day. Okay. The third interacting factor is what the barriers are to remaining smoke free, like uh, do you have a spouse that, uh, so you want to quit, but your spouse doesn't want to quit? Okay, that's a barrier. Um, and then the supports. Do you have social support? Do you have somebody who's cheering in your corner saying, you can do it. You can quit, you can quit smoking. Do it. Good job, everyone. Right? Um, for adolescents, this is uh, slightly different. This is... Um, do you have intrinsic or extrinsic motivation to quit? Okay. A lot of reward operant conditioning is used with adolescents. Okay. Developmental needs. So where are they developmentally? Are they, are we talking about a young adolescent? Are we talking about almost an adult adolescent? Right. They need social support, of course. And um, you need to tell them the benefits of remain remaining nicotine free. Okay. Um, so here's how, uh, these influences work together. Okay. This is how these influence, I'm not going to go over this. You can study this chart. It's pretty much everything I've said verbally. Okay. Excuse me. Um, we can, this is the trans theoretical model. We've talked about it already. So this is the trans theoretical model as applied to smoking, okay? And how long somebody needs in various stages and how much percentage, okay? So this is from Protraska. So for those people, oops, for those people who are in pre-contemplation stage, over the course of 18 months, only about 25% of those people were abstinent. In the contemplation stage, that number nearly doubles after 18 months. But people who are preparing to quit smoking are double the uh, amount of non-smoking after 18 months. Okay, So depending on what stage you're in, um, in the trans-theoretical model developed by Protraska, right, um, will indicate how... Um, much non-smoking will be in a cohort of people, right? So directly related to the stage that a person is in, okay? Um, I don't think I want to talk about relapse. Oh, yes, I did want to end by talking about e-cigarettes. I do want to show this vaping is an epidemic uh, thing. 30 seconds. There's an epidemic spreading. Scientists say it can change your brain. It can release dangerous chemicals like formaldehyde into your bloodstream. It's really creepy. It can expose your lungs to acrolein, which can cause irreversible damage. It's not a parasite, not a virus, not an infection. It's vaping. Don't do it, man! 3.5 billion dollar sales in 2015. I know this is that's that's five years old. You can imagine that number has increased. Um, used by you used more than any other tobacco products by U.S. teens. So the concerns are obviously there are toxic, addictive um, nicotine in those uh, little packs. 
right? Those little, those little canisters. Um, there are other toxic substances. So formaldehyde is one of them. Um, formaldehyde is a carcinogen. It's used to um, help tissue. It used to be used, sorry, to help tissue harden. You know, if you are embalming someone, uh, formaldehyde was used to uh, embalm that person, put their, make their, uh, preserve their organs, but um, makes them unusable, right? Acetylhyde, also a carcinogen, right? And um, e-cigs and vaping actually is a gateway. There is evidence to suggest that um, vaping will, would does actually increase the use of tobacco products like cigarettes or dip um, or uh, or cigars or whatnot. Right? Cigars are slightly a smidge better than anything else, but um, it's a small percentage. It's a small percentage, excuse me. It's a small percentage compared to who, um, who have just tried them, right? So this is total, we're not talking about huge numbers, 20%, 23% being, or 22% being the highest, 18 to 24, trying some form of e-cigarette. But um, you see these numbers are much smaller than that, right? Most, most of them are under 5% of that, oops, of that uh, uh, thing. So it's not huge. $3.5 billion is a lot. Okay, $3.5 billion is a lot. Um, yeah, so uh, that is all I have for you all today. Take a look at that John Oliver... Um, Tobacco is what you want to search for. Last week tonight, tobacco. Um, to watch uh, what it is worldwide. It's like 20 minutes. I think it would be uh, a good idea to watch it. Um, just to see what the difference is in tobacco use and promotion in the developing world versus the United States. Um there's a country in Southeast Asia that's featured that has a um, convenience store right outside of a school. And um, you can buy a single cigarette for a small, you know, small price, right? You can buy it out of, outside of a pack. And they have a lighter tied to a string because, God forbid, you steal um, the lighter. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, so take a look at that if you haven't seen it before. Um... I'm going to end the stream here. Uh, see you so uh, see some of you a little bit later. Otherwise, have a good day. Have a good weekend.